Hello, I'm Andreas Oschlis. The topic of this lecture is, well, engineering the climate. Could one do it? Should one do it? What are the issues? Well, since the invention of the steam engine and the start of the Industrial Revolution, humans have put an enormous amount of CO2 into the atmosphere. The amount of CO2 we have already added to the atmosphere by now, by burning fossil fuels, is about equivalent to the difference between last ice age CO2 concentrations and pre-industrial concentrations. And those gave rise to huge variations between an ice age and the current warm period that has allowed humans to develop societies. So we are worried. Well, we are worried because of um, our information we have from past climate archives, from physical laws that we have that all we combine into climate models that we run and that give us some information what might happen in the future. And you see in these curves, the red curve is basically the business as usual prediction by different climate models. We see there's a huge warming a few degrees by the end of the century. So climate would be completely different. There's also a bunch of blue curves on this graph. So these are curves that assume that society arrives at reducing emissions by a factor of two, so halving emissions by 2050. This would just meet the two degree goal, this is the dashed horizontal line, that many countries, many politicians have agreed upon. This is not impossible. We have the technologies. We could do renewable energy, we could go nuclear, we can do many things avoiding CO2 emissions. So these are the two options, the red curves, drastic warming by the end of the century, or the blue curves, a drastic change in energy production and behavior of our current society. And none of these seems to be working very well right now, and we are not comfortable with either of these. So that's where a third option has been put on the table, and this option is called climate engineering. What is it? Well, climate engineering we define as deliberate large-scale engineering of the climate system. There's a couple of ideas around uh, the class, what we call radiation management. Management sounds very positive, but it's really trying to control part of the radiation that the Earth, the planet, receives from the Sun. Some ideas uh, regard space mirrors and, uh, that would reflect or should reflect part of the solar, incoming solar radiation back into space before it hits the planet and could warm it. Other ideas are centered around uh, modifying the, the color of the planet, so by seeding clouds, making clouds brighter, whiter, also some ideas uh, reflecting, putting reflective aerosols into the atmosphere. We know this from some volcanic eruptions that put up a lot of mass aerosols into the high atmosphere, which leads to some cooling for a few years until these aerosols settle out again. So these are some things we know from nature. We know this from ice sheets, from ice ages. Whiter planets reflect energy and therefore tend to further cool the planet. So there are feedbacks in the climate system that some people think one could engineer, so one could have ideas of removing CO2 from the atmosphere. And the question is, how could we remove this? Well, some way we remove it, and we already do this, and we pay for this if we tick the box of uh, CO2-free air travel or train or car travel. We can buy certificates. So that's the main effect. Trees are plant to suck up carbon and they grow out of the air by producing biomass, and thereby convert CO2 that we have emitted to the atmosphere back into some solid product which does not act as a greenhouse gas. There are also ideas to build artificial trees. So these are machines we have already in submarines and spacecraft that clean the air from our well, waste product that we breathe out, CO2 as well. We have those techno technologies, we have the machines, they're very expensive, and one problem is they need a lot of energy. Where does this energy come from? It should not come from a coal-fired power plant, so then it would produce even more CO2 that the machine sucks up. But at least these technologies, so they, for the first time, address the cause of the problem. They address CO2, and the idea here is to get CO2 back out of the atmosphere. Whereas trees are, well, they need space on the Earth's surface, and there they compete with space for a society, for food production, and space is limited, as we all know. There are some ideas to go into the ocean 
And we could do similar things. We could harvest not trees but algae in the ocean, and they do photosynthesis. They suck up CO2. And there are climate engineering ideas around centered around growing algae in the sea, in the ocean. Well, one could do it particularly well in the ocean with iron. So iron is a micronutrient, and we do not leave large amounts of iron. So small amounts of iron can have large leverage and can lead to sucking up a lot of CO2, a lot of carbon. Other ideas centered about the ocean are making the ocean more alkaline, that is basically neutralizing carbonic acid, which forms by CO2 entering the ocean. If we neutralize this carbonic acid by putting calcium carbonate, by putting limestone into the ocean, for example, we could make more space for new CO2 entering the ocean again. So that would enhance the capacity of the ocean to suck up CO2. That's a chemical process. It also works in nature, and that's how the ocean controls its chemistry and controls the partial pressure of CO2 that is then seen by the atmosphere and eventually controls atmospheric CO2 on very long geological timescales. So again, a natural process that uh, humans might control for their own benefit and by engineering it on a large scale. None of these methods, apart from planting trees on small scales, is uh, operating. On the other hand, we have seen that none of the other options, business as usual, the red curves in the diagram, or reducing emissions by a factor of two, the blue curves, is working right now. We don't have a good solution right now, and we may be well off doing research into some other options which may perhaps work. We don't know yet. We use Earth system models to do a comparative assessment of different ideas of climate engineering that are flowing around. If we now deploy in our climate model, where we don't do any harm to the planet, but just run it in a computer model, all these different ideas, and we assume maximum deployment. But you see on these curves here that, well, basically, none of the methods, even large-scale maximum deployment that we assume, can make a large dent into the rapid rise of atmospheric CO2. So if we are on this high emission, business as usual, emission pathway, we don't have any tools to really suck up substantial amounts of CO2. Global mean temperature, that's what concerns us more than CO2 in our climate system, uh, could be possibly be altered by two of those methods, artificial upwelling and uh, solar radiation management that we have tested in our model, that we have deployed in our computer model. All the other methods do not lead to uh, substantial cooling. And like one method for afforestation, for example, in our model even leads to warming. This was a surprise. So we found by planting lots of trees in the Sahara Desert and Australia, we could suck up CO2 in the model. So that was intended. But then we changed the color of the planet. A forest is much darker than a desert. And so it got warmer in our model because the planet absorbed more heat, more solar radi radiation from the sun. And so that was an unintended side effect, and climate change is even more drastic in this massive afforestation simulation. If we look closer at our results, those methods, and we have identified only two methods that offer some cooling potential, they have, again, dramatic side effects. And that side effect is we can't stop them safely. So if we st simulate stopping the ending the climate engineering of those methods in 2017, our model here, we see a drastic warming. Basically, the system flips back to the original trajectory, and we have all the warming that was basically only delayed within a much shorter time period. So this would uh, be a side effect that maybe we don't feel, but that would be a side effect we impose on future generations. So where do we stand with our assessment of climate engineering? All the methods we investigated have global impacts. That's intended, of course. So we will modify not only ecosystems, but also society. Some parts of the world will be better off, some will be worse off. And that's another side effect. That's a political side effect. And this is against the background of natural climate fluctuations. So we will always have weather, extreme events, hurricanes, droughts, floodings. And so what could happen if, if a hurricane goes through Miami 
and some climate engineering is operating at the same time. So what people blame climate engineering or the person in charge or the state in charge of it. So there are lots of political issues suddenly that come into play as side effects of climate engineering. So what should we do? Well, we have to study it, I think, because the issue of climate engineering is on the table. It's on the table of political negotiations, climate negotiations. We are scientists. We, I think we have the responsibility to inform society and policymakers about uh, potential and side effects, and we have to basically inform the public debate. In the end, the public, society, will have to make decisions. So society will have to de decide, do we want to travel around on these red curves, increasing CO2 emissions, increasing temperatures? Do we want to go to the blue curves, modifying our energy system, our way of life? Or do we want to engage in climate engineering? This is not an easy choice, and we have to do this in an ethically responsible and fair way, fair way to society, to all societies, future generations as well, since they will feel what we do now with our waste products, CO2, in the atmosphere.